Well, amen. I appreciate that uh, time of worship. Uh, a lot of you probably don't know that song that we just got through singing. Anybody know that song, Keith, Keith Green's song? Anybody know that song? That was 40 years ago. Karen could, could was singing. I heard her singing back there. And uh, love that song. If you ever get a chance to listen to any, any of Keith Green's uh, music, it, you'll think that he wrote it yesterday. Well, it's good to be here today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. We're going to read verses 27 through 36. Let's stand. This is one of my favorite uh, passages of Scripture. So um, I've been on vacation, so I'll try not to hold you all past 2 o'clock, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens today. I love this passage. Luke 9, verse 27, Jesus said, I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke to his, uh, of his decease which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. And Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep and, and when they were fully awake they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, I, I love the Apostle Peter. He always does the wrong thing. Here, listen to me. Master, it's good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Didn't that describe us a lot of times? We just don't know what we're saying sometimes. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and, no one, and told no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. I want to share with you one more scripture found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. One verse. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Lord God, I want to thank you, Father, for these passages of Scripture that remind us, Lord God, where our focus needs to be. Lord, with all the things that we've been going through this past year, God, thank you for a time like this that, God, you, you remind us what's the most important thing. And, and God, thank you for the time of praise and worship that we had. God, thank you for a person like Keith Green that wrote that beautiful worship song. God, that is truly what we need to do, Lord, is to seek your face. To seek your face above everything is to seek your pleasure, to seek what pleases you. God, speak to every heart that is listening today. May you be honored. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Well, here we are. Believe it or not, we made it to October, didn't we? October 2020. We are here in this place making it through um, the pandemic, making it through, uh, uh, we're in election time. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, had a lot of things going on, haven't we? Um, I find myself, and I'm sure you guys have found yourself uh, a lot more on social, social media, reading things and keeping up with the, with the news and 
trying to determine what is uh, accurate, what is factual, what is not. Um, I know you, you've been doing that because I have too. And uh, trying to find out who's telling the truth and who's not. Um, and it's pretty exhausting. I, uh, I thought, you know, as we began to plan this month, I thought, okay, when are we going to have the Lord's Supper? And I thought, man, right before an election, that is a perfect time. Because I, I think we've got to understand that Jesus, our Lord, is the one that's going to keep us stable throughout all the stuff that we've gone through, throughout the future, what's going to happen. The day after the election, no matter who wins, Jesus is still going to be on the throne. Isn't that cool? I mean, he's the one that's, he, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I just have to know that. I have to know that. That's what, that's what keeps me stable. That's what keeps me, uh, uh, keeps my feet on the ground, Perry, is my focus has got to be on Jesus. I love this particular story. Jesus is giving some prophecy here about the future. He says in verse 27, he said, he said there's going to be some of you here that shall not taste death until you see the kingdom of God. Now, now they had been as Jewish men, they had been looking for the Messiah to come and set up his kingdom on the earth. They had been waiting for that. And they thought this is a great time for the Messiah to do it. And obviously Jesus is the Messiah. And we've got this, this intruding nation, the Roman Empire. They're, they're taking and running over our country. And, and it'd be just great for God to set up his kingdom on the earth right now. So they couldn't wait. And so Jesus is saying, you're going to see the kingdom of God. Now the problem with that is before he can set up his kingdom on the earth, before he will do that, there had to be something happen. Something had to take place that takes the preeminence over everything that has ever happened in human history. The reason why we can have the kingdom of God, the reason why we can look forward to the kingdom of God is because between now and that kingdom, Jesus is saying something great is going to happen and that is I'm going to die on the cross. He spoke to them that that is the most important thing. And in fact, in this story that, that he was transfigured, he was, he was showing his glory. He was showing who he really is. See, we forget. And, and this is the thing. This is the event. This is the, 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 the job of the church is to show who Jesus Christ really is. Behind the facade of the flesh that Jesus wore, Jesus is God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. And when, when he was transfigured, that glory shone out for everybody to see. For those few moments, the glory of God was everywhere and Jesus was revealed who he really was. You see, there's no shortcut before we get to the kingdom, there's no shortcut to the kingdom. We must have a cross that gets us to his kingdom. There must be payment for our sins. Before we can ever know God, there must be the cross. We must be forgiven of our sins in order to know God, in order to enter his kingdom, in order to be a kingdom people. There, there's got to be a cross. There's no way we can know God. There's no way we can know his kingdom. There's no way we can have a future unless there's a cross. And so we cannot forget the cross. The Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter, chapter 6, 14 through 15. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. God forbid. God for, that's the, one of the strongest statements that any theologian can ever say is God forbid. May it never be that I boast in anything else other than what Jesus has done for me by going to the cross. 
That's it. That's everything. And what you hope people will see is what Jesus has accomplished for me and you. He said, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision uncirc avails anything. But then he wraps it up and says, what, it do what does avail? A new creation. Becoming a new person through the cross. That's what, that's what avails. The circumcision was a, was a type of commitment that somebody said, I'm going to keep the law of God. I'm going to be a faithful Jew. I'm going to keep the Old Testament commands. I'm going to be legalistic in everything that I'm doing. And circumcision was a sign for that. And then you had the Gentiles that said, no, I'm not dedicated to anything. I'm just going to be a naturalistic person. I'm going, to, I'm going to go with the wind. Basically saying, look, it doesn't matter if you're religious. Listen, it doesn't matter if you're religious or not religious. It doesn't matter. What matters is the cross. What matters is your commitment to Jesus Christ. That alone makes you a new creation. Nothing else. He, this story illustrates that with great uh, beauty, I think. As Jesus was taking them up to this mountain, Jesus was trying to describe to them exactly what was going on. He, uh, the Bible says that he took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain to pray. And I, I never really saw this except when I began to go through this at this time. To me, Peter, James, and John are a great description of the church because, because he's taking them up to a mountain. God wants to take us up to a mountain. God wants to take us up to, he wants us to be above all the mess and all the other stuff that we see around us. He is much greater than all that stuff. Amen? That's one of the things that Debbie and I loved as we went to Kerrville this week. I, Judy, they really do have mountains in Texas. I, I, that's a, I, I was amazed at that. And we loved going through those mountains because we, we got to see all the beauty around us. And see the, when you're up way high, it's beautiful. God wants to take us up way high. He wants us to be above all the stuff that we see around us. All the noise, all the politics, all the other stuff that's going on, all the lies. Jesus is much greater than all of that. He took them up to a mountain. It's what God wants to do with us. But as he went up to the mountain, listen what happened. They were praying. The Bible says he was transfigured. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered. His robe became white and glistening. And, but two, and, and behold, two men talked with him. Moses and Elijah were there. And they talked with him about the cross. They, they talked with him about his decease. They were talking to him that he was about to go to Jerusalem. And where was the church? Where were the disciples? <laughs> Verse 32, but Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. That to me describes what the church of the 21st century has been doing. <laughs> we like to sleep. We, we like to just we like to just kind of ignore stuff. And, 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 and you know, I, I've said this before, guys. Uh, there's, no, there's no accident that we've gone through what we've gone through in, in this year 2020. I mean, stuff has happened that has never happened before. And, and I'm not going to tell you that Jesus is coming tomorrow, but I think that there are signs everywhere that things are happening that God's trying to get America's attention. And, 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 and if we're not awake, it's because we're asleep and we're refusing to see what's going on around us. Folks, amen? It's time for the church to wake up. There's a great song by Keith Green, that one of these days I'm going to have the courage to play for you. It's called Asleep in the Light. <laughs> if you've never listened to that, go listen to it. Asleep in the Light describes the church being asleep and not seeing what's going on. These disciples were asleep. 
All of this was going on. Jesus was transfigured. There was Moses. and Everything was happening. Things were going on and they were missing it all. I, I think that's the job of the church is to somehow, the best we possibly can, is, is to show who Jesus is. At this particular time, the veil became unveiled. Jesus was, was revealed in his glorious state of who he really is. The Bible says, though, that that is exactly how Jesus came. Jesus came, and they didn't recognize him. In Isaiah 53, it says, 1 through 3, it says, Who has believed our report, and to, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He, the Son of God, the, the Messiah, the one that they'd been waiting for was walking among them. And they didn't recognize him. They didn't see him. They didn't know who he was. How sad. Jesus was there in all of his glory and they missed it. You see, who is he really? I like what happened when John, and I've, I've preached through the seven churches of, of Revelation, but I love reading this account when the Apostle John really saw him again. He saw him in his glorified state up on that mountain. The next time he saw him in this glorious state was in Revelation, described in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. The Bible says, and John said, when I turned to see the voice that spoke to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about the chest with a golden band and his head and his hair were white like wool and white as snow and his eyes were like a flame of fire and his feet were like fine brass as it, as it refined in, in, in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, <laughs> when I saw him, how did he respond? Huh. I, I hear people say, oh, well, when I go to heaven and I see God, I'm just going to run to him. There'll be a place for that, but when John saw him, the Bible said he fell down at his feet as if he were dead. And this is what Jesus does. This is, you talk about an approachable God in all of his glorified state. There was a man at his feet and he was petrified of the, uh, of the glory that he saw and he was just afraid to move. What did Jesus do? He reached down and touched him. <laughs> but he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid for I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. And the church was asleep. The disciples were asleep. All of this was happening. And, and yet, after a little while, you think those boys would wake up, and they did. They finally woke up. And I, I love what happened to the apostle Peter. The Bible says in verse 32, it says, But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake... <laughs> They saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened as they were parting from Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Isn't that a, what an understatement. It's a, it's a good thing that we're here. <laughs> Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And that's when God the Father spoke and he said, this is my beloved son, hear him. <laughs> Nothing, nobody else 
stands to measure up to our Savior Jesus. The Bible says in verse 36, when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. Moses and Elijah were very impressive people. I know that. Moses was the lawgiver. They, they revered Moses. Moses literally took the commands of God and shared those commands to the children of Israel. The Bible talks about how that, 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 that Moses was a, a friend of God. And Elijah, he was one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. He was the one that, that stood out there uh, and, and called the fire down from heaven to consume the sacrifices. Elijah was a great prophet. But as great as those men were, they were men. Let's not forget that. I, I, I just really want to emphasize this. Let's not forget that. Last time I looked, everybody down on this earth are just men. Amen. L let's, not, let's not hold men up higher than Jesus. Let's not revere man higher than Jesus. Let's, let's focus on the real one, the one who died, the one who was buried, the one who was resurrected. Let's, let's focus on Jesus because if we don't focus on Jesus, these other guys will let us down. Amen? Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament prophecies. Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the one that we've got to focus on. Jesus is the one that we've got to talk up. Jesus is the one that we've got to try to communicate Jesus to the world. We've got to let people know who Jesus is. Jesus will change them. Jesus will, will make them a new person. Jesus will forgive them. Jesus will change them. <coughs> the Bible describes how God speaks. And in his word he speaks, but he spoke specifically through Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3, it says, God who at various times in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds who being in the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The one thing that we cannot ever forget just because Jesus is so approachable, just because he is so humble, just because Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Just because he says that, never forget who he is and what he's done. Now, it was important that Moses and Elijah were there because you have to understand something. It was important the cross was equally important for the past uh, believers as it was for the future believers. The Passover was just a foreshadowing of the cross. The, the lamb was just a picture of the Messiah that was to shed his blood on the cross. The lamb shed his blood. It was a picture of what Jesus was going to do for us in the future. And Jesus fulfilled all of those Old Testament prophecies of the Lamb of God. But it was equally important for the present believers. You see, the kingdom is not found in following man. The kingdom is not found in the principles of man. The kingdom is not found in religion. Those guys represented religion. I've said this before, and I've, I've got to say it again. Religion sometimes hides who God really is. 
Again, you've got to focus on Jesus. Religion sometimes run by man and led by man it has its flaws and its faults. And sometimes we get in the way of who God really is and what God wants for people. The kingdom is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 through 19. He says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Peter is saying, I heard that voice. I heard God the Father say, hear him. The kingdom. The kingdom comes. Listen, the kingdom of God comes when we receive the king. Let me say it again. The kingdom of God comes when we receive the king. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus said a, a statement here. Luke chapter 17, 20 through 21. said, so now when he had, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. What, what does God want to do? He wants to save your soul. But listen, He comes to live inside you. God gives you His Spirit, and His Spirit takes up residence inside your heart. And so you might say the very kingdom of God lives within you once you, once you become a Christian. And, and that happens, and that's why it's being called being born again in John chapter 3, verse 3. When the smoke cleared, and it was a very foggy thing, they were up on the mountain, and, and when the glory of, of God was revealed in Jesus Christ, and, and, and it was revealed who he was, and they were discussing the cross, it was, it was a difficult and, and a glorious thing to see. And I can imagine just from the, from the heart of men seeing, seeing Jesus and seeing uh, Elijah. And I might say, by the way, people say, have said to me before, they've asked questions. They said, well, when we go to heaven, will we, will we know each other? Peter, James, and John noticed that they weren't ordinary people. They knew that that was Moses and Elijah. Amen? Amen? We will know each other. They, they knew the men described, and, and I guess pictures of those men were, uh, were, were etched in stone someplace. They noticed that they were actually Moses and Elijah. When the smoke cleared, Jesus was standing there. Let me tell you, at the end of our life, after everything that we've gone through, in our life, it will only matter what we've done with Jesus Christ. Listen, I want you to vote the way you need to vote, and I, I believe issues are important and all of that, but let me tell you something. How you vote is not more important than how you when you choose Jesus or not. Choosing Jesus is more important than choosing a candidate. Amen? Choosing Jesus is much more than, than, than choosing anything. What's going to matter at the end of this life is not who you voted for. What's going to matter in this life is what you did with Jesus Christ. Did you follow him? Did you, were you committed to him? Did you love him? Did you accept him? Were you grateful for what he did? God the Father described His Son as His beloved Son. 
In Matthew 3, verse 17 of the baptism, he said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But I love this story because the word beloved means much love. God the Father loved his son. But I want you to know that he loves you. I want you to know how much he loves you. As goofy as, as the apostle Peter was and, and all the mistakes that he made and, and, and he wanted to erect a, a, a tabernacles for Moses and tabernacle for Elijah and, and, and Jesus is on equal part, no. That was, that was a terrible decision. That was a terrible thing. Uh, Mo, the, Moses and Elijah are not equal to Jesus. We're, man is not equal to Jesus. And so the Apostle Peter was somebody that made a lot of mistakes. We approach this supper not as people who don't make mistakes. We approach this supper as people who make mistakes and need forgiveness and need help from God. We approach this supper as people who, who need help from God. After Jesus was resurrected, there's a, a great uh, story here. They, they went to the tomb in Mark chapter 16, 5 through 7. The Bible says that they entered the tomb they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. But he said to them, listen to this, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples. And notice he said, go and tell his disciples and Peter. I've always thought that was an odd way. Go and tell his disciples and why would, why would they, he specify Peter? You know why he specified Peter? Why that angel said go tell his disciples and Peter? Because do you realize what Peter just got through doing? When Jesus was being whipped and when he was being, being mocked and, they, they were, and he was bloody from head to foot, the Bible says that, that, that Peter was over there warming himself by a fire. And a young girl said, aren't you one of them? And he said, no. And three times Peter said, no. And the rooster crowed and Peter ran out weeping bitterly because Jesus said, you're going to betray me three times. And Peter said, no way, I'm not ever going to do it. But he did it. He betrayed him three times. I can only imagine that Peter was, was off by himself someplace full of self-condemnation, full of guilt, because when he had the chance to stand up for Jesus, he didn't. When he had the chance to say, yes, I know him, he said, I don't know him. I don't know about you, but you might have written him off. We might have just said, you know, Peter's no good. He's, he's not somebody we can have in our church. He's not somebody that we can have in our family. Boy, he, you know, because when, when the going gets tough, Peter just lets you down. I'm so glad that God doesn't do that. Go tell my disciples that I'm alive and Peter. Go tell my disciples and Robert. He's somehow out, out, out there feeling depressed and down about his failures. Go tell him. Go tell him I love him. That's what he does with us. When we don't deserve his love, when we don't deserve uh, his help, when we don't deserve his forgiveness, he loves us. We take this supper not because we deserve it. We take this supper because we understand what forgiveness is all about. Amen? Folks, I just wanted a Sunday to just go by that we could get our eyes off the television get our eyes off of the news, get our eyes off of the, our, our iPhones and reading what this 
politician says and what that person says and oh let's talk about the virus let's talk about that no I, I just wanted to put all of that aside and I wanted to focus on Jesus because I've got I've got news for you our life we stand or fall based upon our esteem of Jesus Christ. We stand or fall based upon our faith in Jesus Christ or our rejection of Jesus Christ. I, I will say to you that the best thing that we've done so far leading up to this time is when they went to the Washington and they, they had that prayer meeting in Washington, D.C. Not seeking help from a candidate, not seeking help from the political process or the system, but seeking help from God. And ultimately, that's the only one that's going to help us. That's the only one that's going to do us any good. Amen? If there are good things that happen after this election, I hope and pray if there are good things that happen, we won't do this. But we will fall on our faces before God and say, God, thank you for being merciful to us. Because our hope is not in man. It's in God. Our help is not in man, but it's in God. I guess what I'm really saying is, get your eyes off of people. Get them off of man and put them on Jesus Christ. Put them on somebody that will never leave you or forsake you. Put them on somebody that's going to be there after this election mess is over with. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.